Journalism and freedom of the press is democracy. Without it, we don't have it. And we currently don't have it. So we currently don't have democracy. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, today we have another very interesting show for you. We talk a lot on this program about the media, about how it shapes what we see, what we think, and even how we behave, and also how the role of media, or at least how we perceive it, has changed recently. So today on our program, we have an award-winning journalist uh, with a really impressive history with the CBC, who has really gone around the horn in terms of uh, understanding how media has changed. His name is Rodney Palmer. Thanks for being on the program today, Rod. It's really great to have you here. Well, it's an honor to be here, Leighton. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Well, you know, before we dive in and uh, interview you properly, uh, we're going to go to our framing aphorisms, kind of a tradition on the show. Uh, and these are about broadcasters. Some of these are probably be, be familiar to you, Rod. Uh, the first one is from uh, the late, great Walter Cronkite, who said that freedom of the press is not just important to democracy. It is democracy. Another one from uh, A.J. Liebling. Freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. That, that's very true, it seems, today. From George Orwell, who's uh, maybe the most quoted person on the internet, at least on social media, uh, who wrote, freedom of the press, if it means anything at all, means the freedom to criticize and oppose. And of course, that's very much in danger today. We're going to talk about that with Rod. And finally, from Mark Twain, who I quote often on this show, there are laws to protect the freedom of the press's speech, but none that are worth anything to protect the people from the press. Well, who do we have on the show today? Well, Rodney Palmer, he's an award-winning journalist who's worked for 20 years as a foreign correspondent for CTV News and as an investigative reporter for CBC in Canada and abroad. He was the CTV News foreign correspondent and bureau chief in India, China, and the Middle East. He was nominated for a Gemini Award in 2002 for Best Foreign News Reportage and was awarded the Canadian Radio and Television News Directors Award for Best News Reporting for his work in Israel and the West Bank. He is the president and founder of Sonaray, a non-toxic medical grade, far infrared sauna made in Ontario. So, Rod, uh, I wonder if we could start with this. Um, obviously, um, you're you're really steeped in in the sort of media tradition of Canada, and I remember I grew up with the CBC as really the most trusted voice in Canadian media. Uh, tremendous programs, uh, the most, I mean, just, I just you know, think of Knowlton Nash uh, and, and people like that, um, so trusted, uh, great programming, children's programming, news programming, even entertainment. Um, but today's, what we have in, in the CBC, for example, or the CTV, um, is not the same as it was, say, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, is it? It's not the same as it was five years ago. It accelerated this change toward corporate pharmaceutical marketing changed dramatically when COVID hit and they started lining up behind whatever the prime minister said and stopped questioning it. And the whole point, I think one of the, the aphorisms you had there was about the idea to criticize and ask questions. And perhaps the most important one, I think, was Cronkite, who said that Journalism is democracy. Freedom of the press is democracy. And the reason for that is because every day people like you and I might look at an event, Leighton, and decide very different opinions on whether we agree on how to approach that event. But at least the event was real and true. Now we, we don't even know what's true. So how can we decide what's right if we can't agree on what's true anymore? Because the CBC in particular, I looked at the CBC because I worked there and I know the process. I also worked at CTV, but it's a bit of a different animal because it's a private venture. And I noted this because I was kind of born and raised on the CBC like yourself. And then mm -hmm. I worked within its apparatus and I learned it and I admired it. When I went over to work at CTV after about a decade, 
it was a little bit different because it was entirely a private venture. So occasionally you were told, if you say it that way, it might anger some advertisers or we can't do this story because the advertisers won't like it. That was really, really rare, but it occurred. It would never have occurred at the CBC when I was there. So I, I understood that they are beholden to their advertisers because they don't exist without them. But the CBC is a public entity. You and I pay for it. Every Canadian pays for it out of their tax dollars. And we expect it to tell the truth because it has for all those years you talked about. I mean, you mentioned Knowlton Nash, there's Peter Mansbridge, there's right. Patrick Watson. Imagine these names going back. The This Hour has uh, 22, is it, was it This Hour has, it's, uh, sorry, I'm thinking of the comedy version, yeah. the spoof. This Hour yeah. has seven days in the right. 1960s. Sure. What an amazing television show. Mm -hmm. The Fifth Estate. Yes. The Journal, Barbara Frum. Mm -hmm. These are the foundations of our country, not just the foundations of a TV show. Right. And it was all thrown out in the trash when COVID hit and they stopped asking questions. And I recognized it fairly immediately when I heard Trudeau announce, don't worry, Canada, we've invested in a vaccine company. I work in the health business now and I've been to, you know, 300 medical conferences or 300 medical lectures, probably over probably 50 or 60 conferences. And I know that it takes up to a decade to get a vaccine safety approved because they're tricky little things working with right. the human immune system. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's your approach, a decade long approach to the whole country's hiding in their house right now. It was ridiculous. So I immediately asked in my mind, why a vaccine and not some other treatment to cure the disease? No one asked that question. I never heard it. And then when doctors started trying medicines, ivermectin, for example, right. and they worked. So that first started in developing countries where ivermectin is readily available. Sure, there were like lots India, of yeah. Came out of India, for example, yeah. perfect yeah. example, the, the state of Uttar Pradesh, with a population of 250 million people, reduced their COVID death rate to zero in August 2021. And we weren't allowed to talk about ivermectin. In fact, the CBC started intentionally broadcasting lies to the Canadian public and a classic propaganda campaign of misdirection and disinformation. I heard Chris Hall on the house. You probably listened to this show. Yes. The yes. Political show on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And he had this, this liar, Timothy Caulfield from uh, know, the university. Of Alberta. I, know him, I know him. Well, well. And he comes here. Sure, he's, he's in your field and he's in your, in your region. And I'm sure he's very well qualified to be a law professor. But he goes on about medicine all the time and he yes. has zero qualification. And it's very clear he is, he's on a campaign to push disinformation onto people right. such as ivermectin kills. It doesn't kill. It heals. Mm -hmm. the, the founder of it, um, the discoverer, developer, won a Nobel Prize for medicine in 2015, not that long ago. Right. Because of the long track record of ivermectin. Mm -hmm being used in developing countries. Well, when they started using it in Canada, like Dr. Daniel Nagase did in Alberta one night, and he saved three people dying of COVID. Instead, the CBC went after him, said he was talking about uh, misinformation on social media. What a joke. Yeah. Uh, and his license was pulled. Mm -hmm. Well, saved lives. This guy should have his face on a stamp in Canada for ending COVID. <laughs> and they took his medical license away. And the CBC didn't do that story. That's the kind of story I used to do at CBC. Doctors mm -hmm. who were helping people getting railroaded by the College of Physicians and Surgeons, mm -hmm. and we would investigate it and broadcast it and the college would back off. But now right. the CBC is basically doing the bidding of these corrupted and captured regulatory agencies. Mm -hmm. And they're not telling the truth to Canadians. And mm -hmm. every Canadian should realize that if the CBC uses the word health in a sentence, turn it off. They're lying to you. That's yeah. been my general rule of thumb right. over the last two or three yeah. years. So the, the COVID was a big sea change. Another one was the, the liberal sponsorship of what was private media. Of course, you always had the CBC 
Although it, it doesn't appear to me, and you can speak to this much better than I can, that prior to COVID, uh, CBC was so controlled or under the thumb of of government. But you you raise a really good point about about this, Rod, and I want to get your take on this. It seems to me that the media prior to COVID, a big part of their job was to be a check on government abuse, a check on government overreach, an important sort of uh, piece of really the constitutional uh, framework. There was sort of like a watchdog on government. And it seems like in the aftermath of COVID, and now that the federal government is so heavily sponsoring even private media, we've really lost that level of protection for Canadians. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think they went from watchdog to lapdog because they're all just doing what the government wants them to do. But you know what's interesting? People say that the CBC was beholden to the government. I disagree. I worked there for a long time. And, you know, they tend to be a little left of center just because I think that's the mindset of the people go in. They're more uh, right brain, creative writers than they are left brain, analytical, mathematical. That's just who goes into it. Right. And the better you are, the more right brain you are, probably the better broadcaster you're going to be. And they lose that that other side and that expertise. But they hated Stephen Harper. They couldn't stand the guy. Yeah. And he was the prime minister of Canada and he was paying the billion dollar budget. I, I mean, the, he wasn't doing it himself, but it was he didn't damage that at all. It was it was Cretchen, oddly enough, who who announced the biggest cuts. That's when I left the CBC because I didn't know there was going to be anything left of it after those cuts. Yeah. But they typically will. And I think the reason that they disliked Harper was not because of his politics was because he didn't talk to the media. Gretchen would walk out there and say, Hey, you guys, what do you got? He was a buddy, right? But he was smarter than all of them. And he was funnier than most of them. So it was always a good part of your day. Here comes Gretchen, the prime minister. (laughs) But then Harper would go out the back door, not hold a news conference. Mm-hmm. And they all said, well, why aren't you doing that? He said, you know, I'm not obliged to do that. I'm not even obliged to answer that question. You can report on the House of Commons proceedings as you like, but the prime minister, there's nothing that says the prime minister has to make himself available to you all the time. And they mm-hmm. didn't like that. So they kind of hated him. He still paid. The government still funded the CBC. And I think that the government should continue to fund the CBC because if it's corrected back to what it does, it is a critical pillar right of our democracy without which it fails and i believe because the cbc has failed today we really don't have a democracy because Mm -hmm. people can't decide whether to take another covid vaccine because the cbc is telling them it's safe and effective when there's no evidence for either in fact today if you go on the health canada website there's a listing of 455 canadians reported to be killed by the covid vaccines I don't hear that on the CBC. They don't say the government recommends you get a vaccine despite the fact that 455 Canadians are reported to have died from them. And you and I both know that number is a fraction of the truth, but at least it's there. It's reported, it's listed on the Government Health Canada website and they're suppressing it. It's a form of censorship to suppress that fact and elevate a non-fact like it's safe Mm -hmm. and it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, most people weren't killed by the COVID vaccine. That's a fact. But it's kind of a game of Russian roulette because you don't know who's going to get that adverse reaction until it goes in their arm. Right, right. Um, on this topic of um, the importance of media and of free speech and its connection to a democracy, I noticed uh, that just yesterday uh, there was a Canadian reporter uh Rubra Subramania, who is actually in Washington testifying at a House hearing on the weaponization of the federal government. And she said essentially words to the effect that Canada uh, is a cautionary tale to America in terms of the gradual suffocation of free expression that she's witnessed in Canada uh, through the media. I, I take it you'd agree with that with that impression, because What you just said is that really we don't, because we don't have a functioning free media, we really don't have a free and democratic society right now in Canada. That's right. And I think the weaponization is an excellent word. So when you take a very trusted news anchor like Adrian Arsenault, who spent a couple of decades in the field, 
she was a Jerusalem correspondent. She came in just after I was, I left at CTV around the same time we, we crossed paths. She was the Washington correspondent. She's elevated as a serious field journalist. They put her in the anchor chair. She's very good on the air. There's nobody like her. Right. And when she starts interviewing, if she starts telling out and out lies, which she has done and continues to do to the Canadian public, she is a weapon aimed at us because we trust her. They've built that trust and that's the weapon. When they turn it, it becomes a weapon. Right. So you take a trusted person and they lie to you every day about COVID. They are a weapon because they're dangerous because th whatever they're saying will believe because mm -hmm. up until this moment, it's been pretty believable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when they take those people, those trusted people and they make them lie, they create a weapon of the state and they aim it at Canada. They aim mm -hmm. it at you, they aim it at me, they aim it at everybody watching. And I think the healthiest thing anyone could do right now is to turn the CBC off and stop watching it. Wow. This is the difficult thing. And I know you're very, very knowledgeable about that part of the world that you were just talking about, Israel and Gaza, so topical in the news. The difficult thing for, for those of us who are consumers of media right now is we really want to know the truth about what's going on over there. And we really can't discover that by watching uh, mass media, can we? I mean, in other words, we really don't know the truth of what's happening over there right now, do we? I don't think we do. Um, from my perspective as somebody who lived in Israel for three and a half years, and I covered the Intifada from 99 to 2002, the questions weren't being asked. Uh, they're starting to come out now a little bit, a month later. But as soon as I saw the rockets, I thought, how'd they get those rockets? Mm -hmm. Who supplied them? That's not Hamas. That's not the bunch of garage mechanics that I knew when I was there, you know, making a missile in their garage with maybe a 700 meter left or right accuracy, ridiculously inaccurate right. rockets. Right. So where did they come from? Then how did they get them in under the radar of Israel? the most revered intelligence apparatus on the planet. They train most other security intelligence organizations, nation state security, they train them. How did they get them in there? How did they launch this coordinated attack without being heard, without being known? Right. How did it go on for 10 hours so successfully when so many Israelis are armed to the teeth because they're all members of the, of the Israeli Defense Force, either right. active or uh, reserve. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the answers to these questions, but I, don't, I didn't hear them being asked right away. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the problem you have with the media now is there's been, independent of what we're seeing in COVID, independent of the propaganda machine that the CBC has become and is, independent of the disinformation, misdirection and lies that they tell us about COVID, there's also been a shift toward trying to grab the ratings. So what do they want us to see? So is it important for us to tell them the truth about what happened in Israel with the massacre by Hamas or is it just important for us to get our anchor, Adrian Arsenal and put her on the ground, throw a flak jacket on her and a light and say, here I am in Israel. That's right. kind of what it is. It's infotainment. It's theater. You're not going to get the truth right. from the broadcasters. You might get it from a print journalist who really knows the region and goes in and spends time. But it's tough because there are media machines on both sides of that story. The Palestinians never used to have a, a media machine of any sort. I mean, they were, you know, a sad, poor situation, you know, in, in you know, less and less land all the time, Israel pushing them back into uh, little islands uh, that were surrounded by checkpoints. And then of course, Gaza with a wall, ocean on one side, wall on the other, 50 kilometer stretch of people, 2 million people living in there. Um, but so when I reported, if Israel had attacked a Palestinian territory and I did that story and I, it's not, that it was my story. I was assigned to cover the news of the day. There would be a machine that would send emails and make phone calls and letters into CTV 
complaining that I was biased. <laughs> if it was the other side, same deal. Palestinians attack the Israelis. I'm assigned to go tell that story. I never heard complaints from the Palestinians, right? right? So there was not an organized machine back in North America to try to influence the media, which the Israeli pro, the pro-Israeli lobby has, and it's intact and it's excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying I like it, but it's, it's, it's very efficient. But today what we see in the streets of Montreal and Toronto and New York is these big groups of pro-Palestinian versus pro-Israeli. And I think that's got to be fueled by social media because right. we never saw that happening on the ground here yeah. in Canada before. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's an Israeli Palestinian situation that exists on the ground in that tiny strip of land at the end of the Mediterranean. Doesn't really, there's people who, who, who support either side of it here, but you don't usually see that massive rally that's going on. And I right. think something else is fueling that, but to back to the point of, of the truth, who knows? I mean, yeah. basically, yeah, Hamas killed a whack load of Israelis in an unprovoked surprise attack at night. How yeah. many died, how they died, how they were able to do it. We don't know the answers, but that basically, I think we all agree that that happened mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, instantly. I knew yeah. Yeah. Israel's response is going to be overwhelming. They're going to kill 10 times more than Israelis died. And they have now got a green light from the likes of Justin Trudeau, who says, uh, you know, I stand with Israel uh, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's unfolding, right? We're yeah. watching that exact thing unfold. Yeah. I'm not a genius on this. I'm not the only one who knows this. Every single journalist who ever worked there for more than a month would have had that same understanding. Right. Yeah. Every Israeli and every Palestinian who lives right. there had that understanding. So the question is, Hamas, why'd you do it? Mm -hmm. It was suicidal to do it. Suicidal. Right. So I don't hear those questions right. being dealt into too much. I think the New York Times is starting to dig in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in 90 seconds of a TV report, you're never getting the truth, especially now. Yeah. Well, speaking of the truth, I want to come back to COVID and talk a little bit about the Freedom Convoy. And uh, you were involved in a project called uh, Unacceptable Freedom Convoy to Ottawa 2022. You want to talk about this a little bit and why you felt so strongly about it and uh, tell us a little bit about that documentary and uh, how you were involved in it. Well, it's funny you mentioned my feelings about it because I really, I, I didn't have many at the time. I mean, I, I, I disliked the, uh, the mandates. I thought they were anti-constitutional. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I was aware already that the vaccines didn't work because I, 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 I uh, was volunteering with the Canadian COVID Care Alliance, an amazing right. group of Canada's top scientists, medical doctors, healthcare practitioners. And I was simply help, trying to help them in communications. They were the one, they were the scientists in it. Right. I happened to be in Ottawa by chance, Leighton, when that happened. I was visiting some friends and I heard that this convoy was coming. I knew what they were doing, what they were, their idea was that they were mad. Uh, they were organizing a whole bunch of Canadians to say enough. You've, you've pushed us as far as we can be pushed. Frankly, I wanted to leave town because I thought it was going to be a traffic nightmare, really. And it was cold. It was really cold. It was negative 30. I was traveling with the classic. I'm from Northern Ontario. So when we travel in the wintertime alone, we make sure we have snow pants and snow boots and, and maybe even snowshoes, depending on what the weather says. But I had all that winter clothing with me and my associates at the Canadian COVID Care Alliance got me on the call and they said, look, we understand you're in Ottawa. The convoy's almost there. And there's a film director named Benjamin Hab who's with them. He started in, I think it was Fort St. John, BC, and he drove fast to catch up to it. And he's filming it, Verite, as it happens. And we want somebody to film on the ground as it arrives. So the Canadian COVID Care Alliance believed that this was important to document. So they funded 
me to go out and buy the camera equipment. And the next day I did it. And then I went straight over to Wellington street and I started filming. And that's when I started getting strong feelings for it because the mm -hmm. overwhelming feeling was jubilance and joy. And there's right. still a story yeah. on the CBC yeah. on day one, only on day one, where there's a guy, I think his name's David Common. He was, he's a great reporter for the CBC. And he's doing kind of what I used to do. He's just walking through the streets and he's just describing what he sees. Mm -hmm. And he says, fun, jubilance, families, an overwhelming sort of sense of joy. And then the next day, Trudeau said, these people have unacceptable views. They're terrorists, yeah. He's, well, I don't know that he used the word terrorist. Did he use yeah. terrorist? I didn't hear Eventually, that. Eventually, so he, got, he got there. He needed to characterize them as terrorists in order to invoke the legislation uh, to suppress them. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah that, yeah, that almost went, but didn't. Yeah. Um, so, but he did say they're racists. I think he called right. them white supremacists. Yeah. I know Singh, Misogynist, yes. Yes. Singh called, said that they were people who supported pure bloodlines, which is an allusion to white supremacy. Right. Um, but that's not what I observed. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking, okay, you guys are in that building over there. You don't have windows onto the street. I'm standing on the street at negative 30. And I can tell with my own eyes that you're wrong. Right. So I texted my friend who I was staying with and I said, you know, when we were younger, we used to come to Canada day. we all traveled to Ottawa for it. It was a big party. We were in our twenties. It was just so much fun every year, an annual event for the group of friends I had. And she wrote back, boy, that's not what I'm seeing on television. I heard it was a Nazi rally. Uh -huh. And I had my camera and I'm thinking, oh my God, I missed the Nazi story. How could I have missed it? <laughs> so I'm going around looking, I'm thinking, well, there was a, there was a guy with a placard with a swastika on it and it had a, 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 a hypodermic needle drawn on it. And it said, Trudeau is a needle Nazi. Uh, I think, well, that's not never. really flying the old swastika. That's <laughs> comparing Trudeau to Hitler, I suppose. Right. Yeah. So that wasn't promoting Nazism. That was decrying it. Yeah. So that didn't work. And I kept going and I couldn't find it. It was nowhere. And then I saw that picture of the flag and it didn't make sense to me. It was way up high somewhere. It wasn't in the crowd. And there was another one. And every time that flag, there was also two other flags that said F Trudeau yes. and something else. And they're always the same, that same clutch. So it appeared it had to be the same three or four people holding the flags. And one of them was up a wall somewhere. And one of them was in a park. Neither of them were on Wellington street. So I knew that that was bogus, but once right. the prime minister, Jagmeet Singh, the mayor of Ottawa started saying the same messaging, I do, I did what journalists do. I knocked on the truck doors and I said, do you mind if I interview you? I want your reaction to what the prime minister just said. And they all invited me in a little bit quieter. You remember that first couple of days was yeah. a little noisy on a microphone. So we'd shut the doors. I'd sit in the truck and I'd say, I want your reaction to the prime minister saying that this entire rally is organized by white supremacists. Every single guy I interviewed was a man of color. Yeah. A lot of Asian truck drivers. Uh, there's a lot of South Asians. Yeah. Caribbean, yeah. they're, they're largely immigrants, right? Yeah. And not all, but many, um, and certainly a lot of the younger ones, but what I know, and so of course it was a ridiculous question to be asking a Jamaican man, are you a white supremacist, you know, but that, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't resist right. uh, getting that on camera. And I think that stuff made it into the movie. So we put all this stuff together and I handed it to the original filmmaker, Benjamin Hub, And then he carried on, he, he was there with his team right through to the end, all however long, 22 days. Um, he was there for the whole time, including the, the takedown when they decided they had to club them. Even though we learned during the, the inquiry into the emergency, the invocation of the emergency act, that in fact, this, the a city of Ottawa had negotiated an exit strategy for something like 80% of the trucks. And there was a mysterious order from the parliamentary security division to stand down and not let them go. 
for about 24 hours until the emergency act could be invoked. Uh, and they could club them for the TV cameras. Right. And you know, the TV cameras finally came down there. Yeah. When the clubs came out, they weren't there to show that it was a peaceful rally with children. I encountered a group of, of missionaries handing out Bibles. And I got the sense, my gut sort of said, oh, these guys are just thinking, here's a crowd of people. Let's, let's hand out some Bibles, right? It was like the Sunday fair. It wasn't mm -hmm. anything like any sort of hate rally, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. they, had to, they had to stop the thing from growing somehow mm -hmm. or other. So they right. pulled this BS about the hate rally out of their hat. And the media was assigned to tell the story and they did it. Mm -hmm. But Benjamin kept going after it was all over. And he interviewed Tamara Leach in her home after it was all done, reflecting on it. He interviewed other people, mm -hmm. interviewed me about it. So I ended up being uh, an associate producer, a cameraman and a subject of this thing that turned into this film, Unacceptable. And you know, he sent that to film festivals around the world. It was a finalist. At the yeah, can. it's really remarkable. It, it, it's an amazing film, yeah. I think. And I think you can buy it now. I do believe it's streaming now. For the longest time, he, he was doing uh, theatrical showings. He was taking it across the country. Yeah. And th th it's called Unacceptable Question Mark. And mm -hmm. the subtitle is You Decide. Yeah. Whether we can, the people who participated in that were unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So Benjamin is not a documentary filmmaker, but the subject was so rich that he was able to make an amazing film, but he is an amazing filmmaker. He's a great director, lighting, music, editing. These are his skills. And that's why that movie is so phenomenal and yeah. amazing to watch is because this guy who was quietly doing commercial films up in Northern British Columbia is an extremely talented guy. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing thing to watch. Well, after the convoy, you weren't done, though, in terms of your contribution to the Canadian polity and the discussion around COVID. Um, you gave, I would say, one of the most watched uh, pieces of testimony in the National Citizens Inquiry earlier this year. Uh, and it's described online. If those who haven't watched it, you really should go and check this out. Uh, it's described as former international journalist, an expert witness, Rodney Palmer, delivers an enlightening presentation on the funding of the CBC by the government and its implications on news coverage related to COVID-19. Rodney sheds light on the use of chosen experts who themselves receive government grants leading to potential biases in reporting. So, Rod, I wonder if you could comment on your experience with the National Citizens Inquiry and why you thought it was so important for you to participate in it and to provide that uh, that very uh, shocking testimony. Well, Leighton, I don't think any of us knew how powerful the National Citizens Inquiry would become. I think today it's the largest repository of video testimony under oath by people in any country affected by COVID, affected by the particular, not even, not, not oh, sorry, let me rephrase that, the government response to COVID. I don't believe there's a single person who came forward who said I was, I was affected by COVID. They were all affected by the lockdown measures, the vaccine mandates. Right. So they interviewed lots of people who were vaccine injured. And if we simply admit that vaccine injuries exist, the rest of the narrative falls apart. We, we understand they're lying about everything. So I was asked to help organize it in some way um, and maybe do the media relations. But I knew the mainstream media wasn't coming. So I advised them to go light on that because they were going to waste their time. But I thought that my value might be in testifying. All right. So I decided to look into the CBC and I spent about a month and it was, it was, I was on, I was on basically a vacation slash stress leave, um, on a beach. And I wrote every day while I was there for hours. And then I got on my computer and started researching to support what I'd been writing. And I put together this, it was about an hour and a half testimony. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. There's two of them, actually. Right. The first right. one, they're both on Rumble. So if you, if any of your, your viewers want to go Rumble, National Citizens Inquiry, and my name, Rodney Palmer, they'll come up. Yeah. It's also so, available on the NCI website if people want to go there. Well, the NCI website 
uses Rumble because okay. they don't want to shut down. Okay. Um, so I described in the first one how the CBC transitioned from a news gathering organization, which I contributed to and, and it had existed for about 70 years, into a propaganda organization on the behest of Prime Minister Trudeau during the COVID period. Mm -hmm. And I used examples of that and I showed that they were lying, misdirecting, propagandizing. And I, I used the definition of propaganda versus the definition of news gathering and applied it to half a dozen big stories, what I call big lies that they told. And they were told by Adrian Arsenault, Katie right. Simpson, Matt Galloway, uh, Chris Hall. These people lied to Canada and I believe potentially put people in harm's way. People who wouldn't take ivermectin when it could have made them better. People who took the vaccines because they believed they were safe when there was no evidence that they were safe. And they right. used manipulating strategies instead of news gathering in order to do that. So I described that and that really hit a nerve. I don't know that any of us expected that to me, it was obvious. I just had to, it was like doing a piece of journalism. Right. I had my hunch. I did my research. I found my evidence and I presented my story and I did it with the same standards that I would have done anything for the CBC. So I was extremely careful when I name the, the names that I just named, I make sure that I can back it up because most of the work that I did as an investigative reporter at the CBC, my final editor was a lawyer. It was the same lawyer that vetted all the fifth estate stories. Right. So I know the standard by which they work. And I was careful to make sure that it was a solid piece of journalism. So some pretty big thought leaders in this whole movement that we're in, the truth movement, such as Jay Bhattacharya, he, the Stanford mm -hmm. professor, he tweeted out, right. Rodney Palmer politely eviscerated the CBC today. And I think he said politely <laughs> because I gave respect to people like my former colleagues, because I think they're amazing at what they do. They really are. They're right. the best of the best. However, when they lie to us, they become weapons of the state aimed yeah. at us with intent to cause harm, which I believe they've all done. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a polite they, weapon is more effective than a, a rude one. Yeah. Well, f for certain, I could scream and yell at them. And, and I did alone in my car. I started to hurt my throat because <laughs> I was on the radio. I honestly, Leighton, I started listening to CBC French because I don't understand the language terribly well. So when they were talking, I didn't know what they were saying. And the music is actually really nice. I liked it. I like the French, that sort of Acadian uh, style. I've really, and I, I understand Sam Roberts rock and roll a lot better now that I understand French music. So, uh, I learned something by shutting their words off, but it was mm -hmm. the only way I could tolerate it anymore. So Robert Kennedy Jr., tweeted out my testimony and said that this should be standard viewing for every student in every journalism school oh, in North wow. America. Brilliant. And that got 2 million views in about a week. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie Panessi, the, the, uh, the fired ethics professor from right. Western University, she tweeted it out and got half a million views in a week. So probably about 3, 4 million people saw this thing worldwide. And I started realizing that People need to hear this. They need, they all know they're being lied to, but they don't understand the mechanism that it's happening. And it just makes it all more understandable. But, you know, I went back to the NCI and asked them if I could testify a second time, because do you remember when Elon Musk, back when it was still called Twitter, yes, put a government funded media banner on yes. CBC's Twitter? Yes, I do Twitter remember page. that. Mm -hmm. they, got all, they got their knickers in the knot about that, didn't they? They yeah. said, we're going to, they went into a huff and they said, we're not going to use Twitter anymore. Like they care at Twitter, <laughs> CBC's using them or not. CBC gets a lot more out of Twitter than Twitter gets out of CBC, I'm sure. Yeah. So they said the reason was Twitter's definition. Government funded media means government has an influence. And they said, mm -hmm. government has no influence in what we do. And I knew that to be false. So I sent, I complained to the ombudsman that they were lying. And particularly their head of journalistic standards, Brody Fenlon, was lying right. in a piece that he wrote saying that they don't have any influence. He used some pretty 
goofy language, but it basically said the government doesn't have any influence and they, they clearly do on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis during COVID. So I, I sent them the testimony. I said, here's an hour and a half of me testifying under oath about what you do. And the ombudsman dodged it. He said, well, one of the things in there is more than 11 months old and 11 months is my time bracket. I'm not, I don't have any purview to investigate anything older than that. The stuff about <laughs> Fenland lying, uh, that'll, that's up to him. I've, I've sent that over to him and nobody got back to me. So I, I put in a petition to the National Citizens Inquiry to let me testify a second time about how specifically the government influences the CBC. And here's what I learned. They funded a group of scientists called Science Up First, headed oddly by Timothy Caulfield, who's a law professor, not even yeah. a scientist. Not even sure he's a lawyer. Yeah. He's a professor. He might be. Yeah. Well, he's uh, a legally trained and uh, subsequently decorated with the Order of Canada by Mr. The Trump. Order of Canada for lying to Canadians. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What the hell's that about? <laughs> so uh, that's just so they can elevate him even further and put that in an announcement when they put him on. But right. so the Science Up First, they got $1.75 million foundational grant. And their entire mandate was to promote COVID vaccines. And they, and there's a team and you can look them up, science up first, you can look them up on, they have a website and all the names I saw in there and the faces were this daily roster of experts that the CBC goes to. So there's right. one named um, uh, Isaac Bolgotch. There's another, mm -hmm. uh, um, I think it's T Teresa Moriarty is her mm -hmm. last name. Right. Uh, and so they go on regularly as experts, infectious disease experts, um, which they are, but they never say they're seconded from that position temporarily being funded by the Canadian government to promote COVID vaccines. They never say that. They never say they're a member of Science Up First, never once. So they're lying by concealment, the right. CDC, is, in order to promote these people and their ideas. And, and you know, when COVID first hit, the premier over here in Ontario, where I live, he got awfully angry when 3M were, were hoarding the masks for America. And he had a big thing where I'm calling the president of 3M. I'm going to tell him to get them over here. And they went, eh, go away, <laughs> little, little boy from Ontario. So he said, we're going to make them in Ontario. Not only that, we're going to make vaccines in Ontario. We're going to, we're going to make Ontario self-sufficient. And but we should be, right? Every right. province to the degree that they can should be right. self-sufficient and a lot of more things than we are. Mm -hmm. my, so they assigned the top vaccinologist and immunologist we have in Ontario, Dr. Byron Bridal from the University of Guelph, a yeah, professor. Brilliant, brilliant guy, yeah. And he's developed vaccines in the past. He had a long history and they gave him a budget to do it for Ontario. And this first thing anybody given this assignment would do, they say, well, Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca say they've got vaccines. So I'm going to look at their data and see how they, how they tested them, what they've got. You know, let's start on page one here. And he's shocked when he finds out that they're predicting massive cases of pericarditis and myocarditis, particularly among, among young men. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about it. And the CBC eviscerates him on the air. You're misinformation. You're a, a, a conspiracy theorist. He ends up getting shut out of his own lab in the University of Guelph because of all that media treatment. And they put on these people, these, these paid for scientists to lie and say that he's not right. Well, not only was he right, but because the CBC called him a liar, people went ahead and got vaccinated. People went ahead and got myocarditis as a reaction, which will shorten their lifespan. They got pericarditis, which is an extremely painful condition mm -hmm. because they were told it was safe and effective. There's no other reason. People wouldn't, if you were, if you were told it's not safe and probably not effective, would you line up and go and get it? So this happened. The CBC did all this by using these scientists who were paid to tell the story. And when I testified about that at the National Citizens Inquiry, people also paid attention. I'm just going to go back for one moment. Sure. When I looked at the Health Canada website prior to this interview, just to make sure the number was still 455 dead Canadians, there's new information out there on there. 
they have what's called a safety signal. We've heard about these safety signals coming out of the, the CDC in the United States. Right. There's two of them on Health Canada's website now for pericarditis, myocarditis, and thrombosis, blood disease. Right. Caused by the vaccines, specifically identified during Canada's vaccination campaign and also observed internationally prior to that is the language they use. So Byron Bridal, who continues to suffer financially, professionally, and reputationally, has had his prediction come true to the point that Health Canada calls it a safety signal from our right. vaccine campaign. Mm -hmm. So this is what the, where's, where's the CBC saying, oops, we got it wrong because mm -hmm. they didn't get it wrong. They lied intentionally. They didn't make a mistake. But he, he should be suing them all blind yeah. by name, not just by the corporation. Mm -hmm. He's taken a lot of abuse in the courts as well because he's uh, been very generous with his time and expertise in terms of being a witness in many cases litigated uh, over COVID. And uh, like all of our experts, uh, for example, you mentioned Dr. Bhattacharya. He was accused of, of uh, fabricating evidence. Uh, in the Ingram case that I conducted in Alberta, just absolutely shocking disrespect for these very principled people uh, who, as you say, risk so much, really everything that they've worked their entire lives for reputationally, uh, just, you know, to, to tell the truth as you are now in terms of describing what happened uh, with journalism. Uh, Rod, I want to turn the page now uh, one, one, uh, maybe one page further to the NCI talking about this. I was recently on a round table, uh, with Sean Buckley and, uh, Colonel Dave Redman, who I know, you know, about, uh, perhaps you've met and talked with him and Colonel Redman, uh, was talking about the Manning report, which was commissioned in Alberta, kind of along the lines of the NCI, but on a smaller scale, it's made a series of recommendations released at the, uh, of, at the latter part of November. And now the 5,400 page final report from the NCI. Colonel Redman is of the view that what has to happen in Canada is we need to have a full blown public inquiry that has the teeth and the force of law to subpoena witnesses, to put people like the journalists that you described who lied to the Canadian public, uh, to put public health officials there and put them in the chair and have them testify under oath, be cross examined and perhaps even indicted and prosecuted. Uh, Colonel Redmond thinks that that is necessary in order to, to sort of undo some of the harm of the PSYOP, that the PSYOP of fear that's been perpetrated against Canadians. Do you agree with Colonel Redmond in that regard that, that, the, the, that the actual sort of uh, trajectory of the NCI needs to go to, to a public inquiry? Or do you think that it's, it's done its work and it, it, their goals have been fully achieved at this point? I think the NCI have achieved goals, but their goal was to open a dialogue. And I agree fully and completely with what you're saying Colonel Redmond wants to do. It has to, we have to take the National Citizens Inquiry as a model and make it official, not just what they've done and what, what's been said, but to do a redo that has the power to subpoena, that has the power to then take those recommendations into a criminal venue where if we look at the CBC, for example, did the CBC foment hatred against an identifiable group, which is illegal under the criminal code of Canada, the identifiable group being the unvaccinated? Did they promote hatred and fear against them? I believe they did. Further, did they cause people to put themselves in harm's way by providing false information to them with the intention of tricking them into putting themselves in harm's way? And that would be criminal negligence cause injury, criminal negligence cause harm, criminal negligence cause death. Right. And it might be difficult to get a conviction on that because you would have to prove that all of the confounding factors were eliminated and it was only the CBC. 
However, I think that with the journalist case, if they realize that they could be investigated criminally for their job, perform, misperforming and disperforming their jobs. When I say disperforming, I mean intentionally right. lying. Then maybe they'll tell the truth and realize that there's consequences when you lie. Yeah. Because I haven't met one that isn't a liar at the CBC, except for Marion Cloak, who testified at the National Citizens Inquiry, who banged her head against the wall trying to get stories about the vaccine injured that were piling up on her desk, published and broadcast. And the CBC kept interfering and saying, well, you can't put those doctors on that say that the people are right. You have to put doctors on that say that people are wrong. And she said, well, why would I put somebody on that's vaccine injured and then put a doctor on that doesn't know them or their case and say they're wrong? Um, and she was told, do that or we're not, we're not putting it on the air. And so she quit. She retired. Mm -hmm. She was close to retirement. So she pulled that trigger after 35 years as a reporter at the CBC. But for the, like, with, with her, with that exception, I would say that the anchors who told those lies about ivermectin and about vaccine safety and continue to, to this day, the editors that approved the story script, the script writers that wrote the story, and maybe even the technicians that pressed the button that made the microphone live should all be investigated for their role in committing the atrocities, perpetrating the deaths from COVID vaccines, which are reported by Health Canada to kill Canadians, but not by the CDC. Mm -hmm. The um, we've talked a lot about the about, about COVID nineteen and the pandemic, but um, you've also expressed concern publicly about uh, broader issues, let's say of, of of globalism and and that are impact the health of Canadians, and one of them is. Uh, the impact of uh, of, of Wi-Fi. Uh, this is something that uh, that I saw that you've uh, investigated and reported on publicly. Uh, and some children are actually had died in Simcoe County um, uh, from school. Uh, sorry, Simcoe uh, County schools from Wi-Fi. Can you talk about this? The 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 dangers of of Wi-Fi and how that sort of uh, feeds into the broader issue of how. Uh, things like that are impacting are, are impacting Canadians. We talked about vaccines. It seems as though Wi-Fi is perhaps another threat. Is this is this all part of a a broader scheme to impact the health of Canadians? Or what? Why should we be worried about things like Wi-Fi, for example? Well, in terms of the, is it part of a broader scheme? I don't know. Um, I never have to know why somebody's lying to know that they are lying. So getting the intent behind Good that point, lie yeah. is less important to me than knowing that I'm being lied to and therefore I shouldn't pay attention to them. Right. So the Wi-Fi in schools followed another campaign that I was involved with, which was spraying pesticides on your lawn to kill dandelions. And my children were very young. And I got together with a group of medical doctors, chiropractors, other health care practitioners in my small town. And we lobbied this, the, the um, city hall to ban it. And we were like the 114th municipality to do it. So it wasn't, we, we had a lot of precedent there. Toronto had already done it. Montreal had already done it. It started in Hudson, Quebec, where they said, you know, you really don't need to spray these things on the front lawn where children play on the way home from school. Right. When the, then, so we got that done. And then my kids started feeling um, pretty crappy at school, but not at home. There were very specific symptoms. We started, we learned that there were seven kids in my my daughter's elementary school wearing heart monitors because oh, wow. seven. Yeah. And um, like they call it a halter monitor. You wear it all 24 seven. Right. And yeah. it's doing like an EKG constantly on you. And they were wearing them because they had cardiologists who were confounded by their erratic tachycardia. And that's when you go from say 80 beats a minute to 220 beats a minute in one Whoa. beat. It just changes like that. Wow. And so that can be, uh, triggered by fear like let's say a grizzly bear right, uh -huh, right. Um, so, but what was causing it in these kids they didn't understand so they were monitoring them 
And I didn't think that was right. So we looked into it and, you know, because I had been trained as a journalist, we know where to look and we know where to, 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 to siphon off truth from BS. Right. There's a lot of noise on the internet, but we go to the, I found a professor named Dr. Magda Havis at the University of Trent, Trent University in, in Ontario, who was teaching about this already and had written papers about it and had, um, collected papers by other top scientists, most of them biologists in the United States who were looking into this. And the research went back, God, 60 years back to radar. You remember when the Price is Right used to have the, the early um, microwave ovens they'd give out yes, on their show? They call I it do. the I do. radar yeah. range, right? The mm -hmm. radar range. Yeah. That's because Wi Fi uses the exact same signal as a microwave oven. Really? Used for radar, 2.4 gigahertz. This is the signal. Mm. And the Germans found in the cold of 1942 that it could cook food and could thaw food in the field. So they would just put it over by the radar equipment and the food would melt and uh, and they would eat. So then they, 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 from this, they figured out that you could make a little oven. You could contain it. And that's what microwave ovens are. They operate on 2.4 gigahertz. So does the Wi-Fi in your daughter's kindergarten class. Mm. So we're slow cooking the kids. Oh, wow. So that's, I went and got the media to come and we, I said, you know, it's easy to get the media back then. Anyway, you tell them a really fantastic story where somebody's getting harmed. That's true. And it's verifiable. So they came to do the story independent of me. We just alerted them of it. Yeah. And this became a national story. And I went right up to the parliamentary health committee by a series of coincidences. I wound up there testifying. And it didn't matter what I had to say, Layton, because the fix was in. Mm. Health Canada was behind the Wi-Fi because it was being rolled out. They were unwilling to listen. Um, and one of the sad things that we saw, and I believe you, you hit the number, I think there were five kids yeah. who had cardiac arrest in the, in the, either in the gymnasium or during a gym activity in this little Simcoe County. Mm -hmm. And I looked into like child, adolescent cardiac arrest. And it was so rare that based on the numbers of kids in the schools, it was like 50 times higher than would be expected. Mm -hmm. 50 times. If you wow. got one time higher, two times higher, that's an outlier mm -hmm. that needs to investigate it, right? 50 mm -hmm. times higher. And I sent it to the public health the chief of public health in our county. And he said, no, nah, the South Canada says it's not an issue. So they wouldn't even come and investigate. And these kids, I think two of them died and three of them, maybe three of them died. And two of them had, uh, they were revived by their gym teacher through CPR. And they had devices implanted in their chest. One got a, a pacemaker and the other got a little defibrillator that they're going to live with the rest of their lives now in their chest. Wow. All they have to do is not go around wow. high level Wi-Fi. And it was interesting because I talked to a cardiologist about it and he said, you know, it probably wasn't just the Wi-Fi. Maybe that kid didn't have breakfast. Maybe that kid uh, was doing a strenuous exercise, which they all were at the time they were in the gym. So he said, there's, there's, it's, it's a multifactorial uh, incident, right? But remove the Wi-Fi from it and the incident doesn't occur. Yeah. So that's the critical adjutant. Right. I, I don't remember when I was a kid, uh, my 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 schoolmates, anybody ever hearing about a kid having uh, any type of a heart issue. Um, but now it seems as though in some of the advertising that we're seeing, it's being normalized. And I wonder, uh, Rod, I realize you're not a medical doctor, but I wonder how many of these heart episodes that we're hearing about with young kids uh, are not necessarily from the vaccine, but might be due to due, due to this Wi-Fi. Uh, do you think that's possible? It would be a combination, sure. Um, all of the incidents that I just described that were that were cardiac arrests happened in the first two years of the rollout. Okay. So they probably put it in way too strong because they didn't know any yeah. better. I mean, there are people who knew, including yeah. the manufacturers of these devices, because they put warnings on them. Right. But the warnings are in such fun. Who reads that stuff anymore? It's a label yeah. you rip off. Fi and you make Pfizer knew too, apparently. <laughs> Pfizer knew as well. The yeah. Moderna knew as well. Yeah. AstraZeneca knew as well. Yeah. Um, so they know. So what they've done is, so back to those, those incidents, 
right now we have a compounding factor of the vaccines causing cardiac arrest. So right. I would say probably, and I'm only guessing as a, as a lay observer here, right. but probably the uptick in all of that, particularly among athletes is vaccine related, Yeah, but there could be a component mm. of the Wi-Fi or a cell phone tower nearby can also mm -hmm. cause, uh, be an adjutant. The 5G is particularly powerful. Mm -hmm. None of this, none of it has been tested on human health to anybody's satisfaction who studies mm -hmm. this. No. They're just rolling it out knowing that it's a problem. Um, I think more than trying to think that it's part of a big scheme to kill us all, which it may or may not be, I don't know. But it, it identified to me regulatory capture. It identified that when I worked on the pesticide question, the Monsanto, the biggest producer right. of pesticides, they make her of Roundup, they right. lobbied the Ontario government to create a province-wide pesticide ban that excluded Roundup. Really? Ban. Yeah. Wow. And... The premier at the time was a man named Dalton McGinty was asked right. by a reporter, will this supersede the municipal bans of which there were dozens in Ontario? And he said, no, 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 the, the municipal bans stand. Two days later, he comes out and says, actually, it's going to supersede the municipal bans. In other <laughs> words, if you didn't have an exemption for Monsanto in your pesticide ban in your town, like the city of Toronto, you do now. Right. So out comes the Monsanto again, spraying Roundup all over Ontario lawns legally, even though oh. there's a ban by the people. So they go higher and they capture. And so the pesticide companies have captured the, then clearly the telecom companies rolling out the wireless because really, why do you need wireless? Do we really need, like it's, mm. it's the scourge of our teenagehood, this, you know, yeah. these kids, these phones and, um, and, and you know, they put up these towers next to every schoolyard in the country for a reason, because yeah. those kids are using the data time. That's, yeah. that's their target. The target is our children every wow. time, wow. irrelevant to the potential health. The target is our children. Wow. Wow. So I saw it with pesticides. I saw the, the regulatory capture with the telecom and then it became dead obvious to me. I guess that's why maybe I was preloaded to figure this out more quickly than mm. other people because I'd yeah. seen it happened with the pharma i instantly knew as soon as i heard trudeau say vaccines the way out i went okay light bulb went off it's a big scam i didn't know really how much of a scam it was at the time uh, how they perpetrated it all is truly remarkable yeah i might even say as a businessman admirable to some degree in yeah. how they did it all it's really yeah. mind-blowing how they did it all how they got this PCR test that the inventor mm -hmm. of the test said, don't use it for diagnostic. It's going to give you false positives. And they used it and got a zillion false positives. Yeah. How they made it so you could swab the nose of a suicide victim dead yeah. and declare it to be COVID, um, which we heard at the National Citizens Inquiry by an ambulance driver mm -hmm. who testified. Um, how they managed to completely capture the entirety of our media to report falsehoods in a harmonized fashion instantaneously and fully formed is phenomenal, mm -hmm. but it happened. Mm -hmm. it did yeah. happen. Yeah. Why it wow. happened, I can't say. Who yeah. did it all, I don't know, but it happened. Well, maybe that's why we need to have that inquiry. But, I uh, think that inquiry yeah. needs to have yeah. teeth and it has mm -hmm. to have the potential to trigger criminal investigation. Yeah, yeah. Rod, just uh, just an incredible conversation. I knew it would be. Uh, I always enjoy having real pros in terms of media people on the show. Uh, we're very, very interesting. And uh, I want to, so we want to thank you so much for this time. Very, very grateful for it. We come to the show where we, where we sort of wrap up. We call this the reading list. I've got a, I've got a couple of uh, uh, selections that are going to be added to our, our reading list on the podcast. And uh, Hopefully you'll have one or two for us as well to, to close out the show. Uh, the first book that I'm recommending uh, to people is called The New Censorship Inside the Global Battle for Media Freedom. It's by uh, Joel Simon. And the description is that uh, 
Journalists are being imprisoned and killed in record, record numbers. Online surveillance is annihilating privacy, and the Internet can be brought under government control at any time. But Joel Simon, who is the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, warns that we can no longer assume that our global information uh, ecosystem is stable, protected, and robust, as uh, Rod has talked about today. Journalists are increasingly vulnerable to attack by authoritarian governments, militants, criminals, and terrorists who all seek to use technology, political pressure, and violence to set the global, inf the global information agenda. So that book goes into some of the reasons why uh, journalists are behaving the way they do right now, sort of in this uh, environment of fear. And, and uh, it puts a different perspective because it shows that many of them are very afraid or just as afraid as the people that they're reporting to, in some cases, even more so. And then uh, the other book comes at us from a different perspective. This is called The Case Against the New Censorship, Protecting Free Speech from Big Tech, Progressives and Universities. This is from famed lawyer, U.S. lawyer Alan Dershowitz. Uh, and this book is already a New York Times uh, bestseller in this book. Uh, Dershowitz, who's one of America's most respected legal scholars, analyzes the current regressive war against freedom of speech being waged by well-meaning but dangerous censors and proposes that this can, uh, this can be taken to defend, reclaim, and strengthen freedom of speech and other basic liberties that are under attack. So those are our selections. I'm going to turn it over to our guest. Hopefully he has a couple to share with us to close off the show. I like both those suggestions. I'm going to look both of them up because censorship is, is, is a critical thing right now. It's a weapon of the state. It's a super weapon right. because without censorship, they can't do anything that they've been doing. They can't perpetrate the atrocities that they have. Yeah. So it comes back to like that to... Cronkite quote that we had off the top of the show, as you said. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Journalism and freedom of the press is democracy. Yeah. Without it, we don't have it. And we currently don't have it. So yeah. we currently don't have democracy. I would like to share a book called A Canary in the COVID World. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned this one. I, Rod, sorry to interrupt. I actually wrote a bit of a foreword to that book. But thanks for mentioning this one. Go ahead. And I wrote a chapter in it. And oh, we didn't get paid. None of us got paid. I'm sure you didn't get paid. Um, we uh, There's 34 of us. They're called like like the canary in a coal mine, like the early right. warning system. Yeah. And I wrote about journalism and... Peter Pierre Corey wrote about the suppression of Ivermectin. Lord Sumption, the longest serving member of parliament in England, wrote about the parliamentary uh, shenanigans that went on. Um, Naomi Wolf writes about being a deplatform for Twitter for simply retweeting a fact that the, the early warning signal out of England were that women were having disrupted menstrual cycles caused by the vaccine. Look out, ladies. You know, she's a feminist author on the side of women and women's health and was deplatformed and lost university appointments because of it. So mm -hmm. if you read through that book, you will get the entire picture of what went down in COVID. And it's an yeah. easy read. Yeah. I like it because like I, everybody's chapters around two, three thousand words. So you can get through it in 15, 20 minutes. It's, it's a little bedtime read or a morning yeah. read or a yeah. coffee read. So a canary in a COVID world. Uh, it's available on Amazon.com, and um, the, uh, the the proceeds go th to Children's Health Defense and other charities that are currently defending people who have been harmed or in legal situations oh, because brilliant. of COVID brilliant. response. Another one that I would recommend is Tamara Leach's book, Hold the Line. Oh, yeah. This is, in her own words, what happened, what she did, and what's happening. Now, Tamara even now is still on trial for mischief. Yeah. It's gone on to its third month and mm -hmm. she served 30 days in prison for breach of undertaking. Right? So this is often worse than the original crime. And they it's dropped great. that charge rod. They dropped president. it. Yeah. She already served 30 days for it and they've dropped it. How ridiculous yeah. because there was no evidence. She went, there was no, there was no intent to cause crime. She, uh, was told not to associate with three different people. There was going to be an event where she was going to receive an award and some of them might be there because it was a public event. So she and her lawyer went to the judge and and petitioned for permission to attend the event, given the extenuating circumstances of these other people being there. And they said, well, the conditions say, you know, if a lawyer's present, you can be with them. So he says, link arms with your lawyer and enjoy the party. Go. <laughs> and then next thing you know, She's yeah. in prison for going there because of the people that were at the event yeah. standing near her. Yeah. So 
this is a very, very interesting book, Hold the Line by Tamara Leach. And I strong, she is the spiritual leader of the trucker movement. She, without her, it didn't have a face. Yeah. There were thousands of people that made that happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were tens of thousands of people that participated in it. All of them uniting on a single issue, government back down on this overreach. Yeah. Yeah. I did a live from the front of a truck with Glenn Beck show in the U S oh, really? for about two hours. And, um, mm. during which he's, he, he sort of facetiously said, are there white supremacists there? And I said, Glenn, there's a hundred thousand <laughs> people there. Some of them might be for sure, but they're not talking about that. They're mm -hmm. talking about this. And isn't it interesting for the people across the political spectrum from the, one extreme to the other can agree on something. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. what was happening. That was the beauty of that moment. And mm -hmm. you can read all about it in Tamara Leach's book. One other thing I'll, I'll suggest as well for your list is uh, a film, not a book. It's called The Big Picture. It's oh, a new really? film. It's six parts. So it's six 40-minute chunks. You have to pay $25, but you get, you get a permanent login. And you can watch it as many times as you want. You can hold screenings at your home. You can show other people. And this is uh, funded by the Children's Health Defense. Right. It's by a filmmaker named Todd Harris, who also did a film you may have seen, Leighton, called uh, Uninformed Consent. I have seen that one, yes. Yeah. So the same filmmaker mm -hmm. did a six-part series called The Big Picture, and he really takes a 40,000-foot view down on what's been happening. Mm. And it's a lot of surprises in there. It'll make the hair on the back of your neck stand up at mm -hmm. moments. And it ends with a message of hope, which I think we right. all need right now. Right. And it suggests no. that moving in the right direction. The reason it suggests that is because people are talking about it now. Yeah. You're talking about it. There's a radio station in uh, Ontario um, where it's got the morning man. Randy Taylor is talking about this every day. He's interviewing somebody. About it, this really? Thing. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so bigpicturemovie.com is how you find it. We'll provide that link for people so they can check it out. And I'm certainly going to, uh, I'm certainly going to watch it. Uh, well, thank you so much, Rod. This has been my absolute pleasure to have you as our special guest. Uh, I hope I'm going to see you again at the We Unify conference uh, in the coming spring. Uh, I understand it's going to happen again. And there's going to be some really great uh, uh, speakers there once more. Uh, but anyway, I just want to thank you so much for being with us and for giving us your time. We're so grateful for it. Uh, and uh, so thanks for being our special guest today on Grey Matter. Thanks for inviting me, Leighton, and thanks for all that you do for the people of Canada. Thanks very much.